Session. Order, Senator Stokey will be in continuation. Thank you for your understanding. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Every three months, the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission reports on their compliance checks of the aged care sector. Can the minister confirm that for July to September 2019, standards were not met in 37.3 per cent of site visits and 100 per cent of review audits? When did the minister become aware of these alarming results and what immediate action did he take in response to these warnings? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. President, uh, Senator Gallagher is correct. The Quality and Safety Commissioner uh, does report on a quarterly basis, and uh, as is required, uh, and the Quality and Safety Commissioner provides a reporting process to government as well, Mr. President. And the expectation of government is that all aged care providers respond to the uh, and and comply with the regulatory framework uh, that is in place across the country, Mr. President. And so, uh, my conversation with the Quality and Safety Commissioner is to ensure that the regulatory actions that are being taken by the Quality and Safety Commissioner as an independent agency of government uh, ensures that uh, they work with the providers to ensure that they are brought to compliance with, uh, with, their requirement, with the requirements of the Quality, uh, quality Code. Mr. President. So that's, that's the requirement. The, the Quality and Safety Commissioner, as an independent agency, has the responsibility to ensure uh, that they take appropriate regulatory action uh, and compliance action with respect to what they find uh, as a result of their inspections and their reporting processes. So my expectation, Mr. President, is that all providers comply with the quality standards. And again, my expectation of the Quality Commission is that they ensure that providers do come back to conformance once they uh, have met. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister confirm that for the October to December 2019 reporting period, standards were not met in 45 per cent of site audits and 100 per cent of review audits. When did the minister become aware of these alarming results and what immediate action did he take in response to this warning? The minister, uh, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, as, as I've just said in my answer to the primary question, uh, as an independent regulator, it is the responsibility of the Quality Commissioner to, mean, to take regulatory action and Order. to work with providers to ensure that they bring their compliance back to standards. That's the responsibility Order. of the uh, Commissioner. Mr President, uh, the Labor Party voted with the government late last year to complete the formation of the Order. Quality Commission, to bring it under one control, Order on my left. To, to ensure that we have, as has been recommended by a number of reform processes, Mr. President, that uh, that we bring it to, on into one left. organisation that has regulatory responsibility across the aged care sector, Mr. President. So, and I expect both providers to meet the standard and the Quality Commissioner to do its role, which is to ensure that they do. Order. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. For January to March 2020, the latest reporting period, standards were not met in 41 per cent of site audits and 87.5 per cent of review audits. Given these appalling and shameful audit results came before the series of warnings he ignored, including Dorothy Henderson Lodge in Newmarch House, how can Australians possibly have confidence he will ever protect Australians in aged care. Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. Order, Mr. Senator Watt. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President, and thanks, Senator. Order on my left. Mr. President, all of us have our resp various responsibilities within uh, the government. Senator Watt. And and with, with, within the re regulatory process, Mr. President, my expectation as minister is that Senator all Watt. providers comply with the quality standards, Mr. President. That is the expectation of the government, and, 
And Mr President, I expect that it's an expectation of all of those who use residential aged care in this country. Mr. President. We all expect that there's high quality care provided by residential aged care providers, and, and that's why we have the regulatory frameworks in place uh, to undertake that. And that's why the quality commissioner has the responsibility Order. for the oversight of those Order regulatory frameworks. And, and the compliance with those frameworks and to ensure that, co that providers come into conformance with those standards. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government's skill reform agenda has strengthened our vocational education system for the road to economic recovery? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question. Mr. President, as Australia and Australians recover from the devastation of COVID-19, supporting a skilled workforce has never been more important. In addition to the support of the JobKeeper payment, which, as we know, is seeing around 3.5 million Australians maintain that so important connection with their employer, the Morrison government will invest a record $6.5 billion in skills to keep apprentices and trainees on the job, but also to ensure that Australians have the skills they need to move into employment. Our $6.5 billion investment includes $2.8 billion in terms of our support for apprentices and, tra and trainees and keeping them on the job, and of course the $1 billion job trainer fund uh, to help Australians upskill and reskill in areas of demand. Uh, South Australians will be pleased to know that yesterday, Mr. President, I announced with the South Australian Premier Stephen Marshall and the South Australian Skills Minister David Pisoni the launch of the South Australian Job Trainer Fund. That is a skills funding boost of around $69 million in South Australia. And I congratulate the South Australian government on working with the Commonwealth to ensure that we have this important injection of additional funds into the South Australian economy. Mr President, that around $69 million will now support thousands of South Australians to transition into further training or employment in areas of demand in South Australia. And of course, the $1 billion job trainer investment by the government, matched by with the states and territories, builds on the substantial skills reform agenda that we have been implementing since 2018. We've established the National Skills Commission to, of course, improve labour market forecasting and skills needs assessments, which will inform the work in terms of the job trainer fund. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Minister, in addition to this record invest investment in training, what steps has the government taken to repair the reputation of our vocational education system since coming to government, and why is this essential to support a skilled workforce to drive our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, uh, the former Labor government, as we know, were the architects of the greatest damage ever, ever on the vocational education and training sector in Australia. They implemented in their wisdom, in Labor policy wisdom, the failed vet fee help scheme. What did that do? It saw billions of dollars defrauded from vulnerable students who were simply trying to attain a qualification to better their employment prospects. Colleagues, to date, to date, the Australian taxpayer has now recredited in excess of $2 billion because of Labor's vet fee help failure. And in fact, Senator McLaughlin, in South Australia, around 8,500 stu students to date, because there will be more, have had their funds recredited. Senator Watt, in uh, Queensland, 38,000 Queenslanders, 38,000 students in Queensland have had to be recredited because of Labor's failed vet fee Order, help policy. Senator Cash. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. How is the government building on this achievement to ensure quality remains at the centre of our skills and training system as we emerge from the economic impacts of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And as Senator Wong is saying so eloquently across the chamber, you know, it's seven years in government and you're still talking about what Labor did. Well, you see, Senator Wong, when you wreak devastation 
on Australia's vocational education and training sector, when you actually decimate its reputation, it does take years to rebuild. We have now recredited in excess of $2 billion because of Labor's failed scheme. And, uh, Senator Wong, 8,500 students in South Australia they had to have their monies recredited because of your failed scheme. But Mr President, what else, what else has the Morrison government done to ensure that we restore the integrity to Labor's failed system? Well, as you know, skills is a priority for this government, and as such, we've taken action to bolster the regulator, uh, the Australian Skills and Quality Authority, to ensure that quality training is now being delivered by private providers, uh, and that is what we are doing. Senator Keneally. President, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Citizens, Senator Colbeck. Yeah, yeah. Yesterday, the Minister was not able to advise the Senate how many older Australians had died in aged care this year, not as a result of COVID-19, but as a result of neglect. When asked about the deaths by neglect, the Minister shrugged and dismissed deaths as, quote, one of the functions of residential aged care. Can the Minister today Outline the Senate. Order, order, Senator Keneally. Order, order. Show you the video. Across the chamber. Order. Senator, senators, Senator Watt, Senators Payne and Wong. Senator Keneally, I will ask you to continue your question from the conclusion of the quotation you, you referenced. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister today advise the Senate how many older Australians have died as a result of age of neglect in aged care residential homes he is responsible for? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And I have to say again the dishonest misinterpretation. Order. Order. The dishonest misinterpretation or misuse of my words by Labor again and the mischaracterisation of what I was saying yesterday uh, continues in the chamber. And Mr President, uh, Se Senator, Senator Keneally is, is a master of this. In fact, uh, she, she attacked the former CEO, uh, CMO in a Senate in inquiry order. over Senator the use Wong, of language. I, I can anticipate it, but I'm going to let you make your point of order. Point of order direct relevance. The response is not directly relevant to the question, which is a serious question about how many people have died as a result of neglect in aged care homes for which this minister is responsible. Senator Cormann on the point of order. Uh, th thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, the, the minister could not be more directly relevant. Just because he's not following the uh, partisan political script that Labor would like him to follow doesn't make him irrelevant. Order. On the point of order. I, I, Senator Wong has a point on the minister turning to characterising other actions of the per senator who asked the question. That is not directly relevant. It is, however, directly relevant for the minister immediately prior to that was challenging the way a quotation was used to characterise a question. So turning to other conduct of the senator asking a question, however, is not directly relevant. So, um, but the minister is allowed to challenge the way the question was put. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, what I did yesterday was to state, merely state a fact, to state a fact, Mr. President, that about 60,000 Australians pass away in aged care every year. It is Order. a sad fact, Mr. President. Senator and I White. don't believe that you could characterise in any sense. Senator Watt. I don't think that you could characterise in any sense the question that Senator Keneally tries to. Uh, implied. Senator, Senator Watt. Mr. Mr. President, how do you classify what Senator Keneally is trying to pursue? Mr. President? There are 40 per cent of residents in aged care facilities in this country who pass away with no visitors. Mr. President. Uh, the, the Royal Commission report talked about neglect. Yes, it talked about the system that we have all we ha that, that we, that we have, on my left. That governments over a period of time have, uh, have not built to a standard that it should be. That's, Mr. President, that is, the, that is the focus of this government. We want to see all senior Australians 
treated with respect in a healthy and safe way and ensuring that all residential aged care providers are providing aged care in a way that we all expect. Uh, the Royal Commission's Order, report— Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The head of Monash University's Health, Law and Aging Research Unit, Professor Joseph Ibrahim, told the Royal Commission that, and I quote, hundreds of residents will die prematurely because people have failed to act. Isn't this why the Royal Commission has characterized the Morrison government's handling of aged care with a single word, neglect? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And Mr. President, um, the government has contested the evidence provided to the Royal Commission by Professor Ibrahim, uh, and that was uh, quite strongly contested by the Chief Medical former Chief Medical Officer and now uh, Secretary of my department at the hearing of the Royal Commission uh, just a few weeks ago, Mr. President. So we can we can test the evidence provided to the Royal Commission by Professor Ibrahim, uh, and so uh, Senator. So Senator Keneally might like to select one witness. That's fine. Uh, the Labor Party can select one witness that suits their particular argument. But, Mr. President, the government has been working with the sector since January to assist them to be prepared for COVID-19, which was the subject that Professor Ibrahim was talking about. And we quite rightly took the opportunity to contest the evidence provided to the Royal Commission by Professor Ibrahim. Senator Keneal, a final supplementary question. The Morrison government refused to act when the Royal Commission said it would take an additional $621 million per year to improve the aged care system. When the minister is putting off, why is the minister putting off until tomorrow what he knows older Australians need today? How can Australians possibly have confidence he will protect Australians in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And the report that Senator Keneally uh, refers to was a submission made uh, to the Royal Commission recently, and it uh, does an assessment of the aged care sector based on a number of uh, combined criteria, not the criteria that uh, we are using uh, in the context of the assessment of uh, quality of care, Mr. President. And it makes it makes a number of estimates as to what the costs might be to uh, with with respect to the, the system as it currently stands. But what we're looking to do, Mr President, is to improve the aged care system. That is the whole point of the Royal Commission. That is the whole point of the Royal Commission. And so the, so the report that uh, so, so the, 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 the point of that report Order, is to Senator assess Watt. the system as it stands now uh, and to give the, give the Royal Commission and the government some direction as to where we might go to, to the future, including on a range of issues, including, uh, which incorporate potential additional costs under Order. a number of different frameworks. Senator Colbeck. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Cormann, representing the Prime Minister. Senator Cormann, isn't it true that without Commonwealth environmental protections, the Franklin River would have been dammed, the Great Barrier Reef would have been riddled with oil rigs, and whaling in Western Australia would have continued? Order on my right. Senator, you've concluded your question, Senator Hanson Young? Yes. Senator, Senator Cormann. Uh, th th <coughs> th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Hanson Young for that question, and it's my great privilege to confirm for Senator Hanson Young that our government supports environmental protection. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, note that the minister didn't actually answer my question. Um, the environment minister has said that this government will introduce in national environment standards after the passage of this piece of legislation currently before the House. Why would we trust that this government would do anything? to act in the interests of the environment when we know all they're doing is acting in the interests of the fossil fuel industry. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. I completely reject the premise of that question. Uh, what I would say is what I uh, have said often in this chamber over my 13 and a half years here, and that is on outside of the chamber, we support environmental protection in a way that is economically responsible. And we do want to see uh, Australia continue to go from strength to strength 
creating opportunities for Australians today and into the future to get ahead. We want to have projects get up across Australia, and we want those projects to be rigorously assessed to ensure they comply with all of the relevant environmental laws at a state and federal level. But we want those processes to be conducted in a way that is efficient. That is efficient, and that is why we are prepared to entrust. Uh, these uh, sorts of um, arrangements to state governments. And, you know, in Western Australia, that is a state Labor government. Unless you're saying that the state Labor government in Western Australia is a bunch of environmental vandals, then I don't know what it is that you're accusing of, us of. I'm not accusing them of that. I think that the state government in WA Order. has got the same Senator objectives Coleman. as us. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Interesting that the minister refers to WA because, uh, of course, we've seen what happens when there's not strong enough environmental environmental protections, Rio Tinto blows things up. How many times has this government had representatives meet with Rio Tinto or Santos in relation to the Narrabai gas project to get these laws passed, to vandalise our environment? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I think the issue that Senator Hanson Young is referencing there relates to state legislation, actually not federal legislation. Uh, the second point I would make is uh, that uh, our government does not support uh, environmental vandalism ever. Order. Uh, we, we support environmental protection in a way that is economically responsible. We want to see uh, opportunities created for Australians today into the future to get ahead uh, while we are also preserving and protecting the great value of our environment. But we don't want to lock, lock Australia up. We don't want to lock Australia up. We don't want to prevent further development uh, in, in a way that is environmentally responsible. And you know, the truth is, listening to the interjections, which I should be ignoring, I know, Mr. President, the truth is there is no level of uh, development that the Greens would ever accept. I mean, if it came down to the Greens, we would be all going back into the caves. We would be all going back into the caves. We wouldn't be driving any cars. Although I mean, I'm sure that you got here by car. We wouldn't fly planes. Although you you came here by flight. Order, I mean Senator Coleman. Um, Senator Griff. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. In the past week, we have had two reports flagging problems with aerial firefighting arrangements. Yesterday, the Royal Commission into Natural Disasters published an interim report which found the Commonwealth's aerial firefighting procurement requires reassessment. And last week, the New South Wales Bushfire Inquiry report found a lack of aircraft hampered firefighting, including the vital work of extinguishing small fires before they spread out of control. That inquiry recommended a review of the current mix of aviation assets. Minister Littleproud is committed to acting quickly and says the government's financial commitment will be there. But, Minister, what will the government actually do? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you very much, um, Senator Griff, for the question and uh, for some advance notice on the topic. Um, well, as you rightly point out, the Royal Commission um, interim report in relation to the national uh, natural disaster arrangements was brought down yesterday and made reference in that uh, report uh, to Australia's capacity to deal with natural disasters, but particularly in relation uh, to bushfires. Uh, but it also did make the point that, uh, that bushfires are not our only natural disaster of which we have to address. In, in relation to, um, to aerial firefighting, um, Minister Littleproud has made it very clear that the Australian government understands that we do need to, to I suppose, address our aerial firefighting capability on the basis of what is going to be um, the new normal when it comes to, to bushfires. In fact, I think the Royal Commission itself acknowledged the fact that the conditions leading up to last year's bushfires were absolutely unprecedented, but we should never expect them to be unprecedented again. Um, so, as part of that, the Australian government has uh, has made a commitment in this year's budget uh, to 26, uh, over $26 million to the National Aerial Firefighting Centre, and this money will contribute towards the purchase of 100, uh, sorry, for the lease of 150 firefighting aircraft. Um, they um, will be made up of a, of a number of different types of aircraft, some of which will be dedicated to the, the smaller. Um, um, response to smaller fires that you refer to, whilst other things like the large fixed-wing aircraft are obviously an air tankers are, are much more dedicated towards um, delivering a service to fight fires on a much wider scale. Um, but the government has uh, has absolutely acknowledged the, the need and the commitment towards supporting our amazing um, um, fire 
firefighters out on the ground to deal with what has, uh, has proved to be over recent years um, continuing worsening of our bushfire season and also acknowledge the, the extraordinary on the ground support that we Order. received from Senator the ADF. Rustin, Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Minister, both reports identified procurement arrangements, which includes leasing that you referenced, as being inadequate, and both flagged the risk of converging fire seasons will make it far more difficult to ensure access to aircraft. Has the government studied the possibility of requiring or having an Australian dedicated fire flighting aircraft fleet? And if not, uh, will you commit to urgently undertaking such a study? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, and uh, as you um, point out, uh, the, the, the changing nature of, of our bushfire seasons are, are requiring us to take a new uh, look at how we address the assets that we need in order to combat them. And one of the things that the Royal Commission's interim report did highlight was that we did need to have a look at the ongoing capacity of the Australian uh, ongoing Australian capacity. Um, but as you would be aware, um, we have um, in the past um, used leased aircraft for, for a number of reasons. One um, clearly is that the cost of purchasing aircraft is, is, quite, is extremely high and the maintenance of specialist firefighting equipment that may only be used occasionally and we hope will only ever be used occasionally. Um, in, in, in actually comparing that with the capacity to be able to lease aircraft, but also the opportunity to be able to share resources with colleagues in the northern uh, um, counterparts in the northern hemisphere whose seasons are often countercyclical. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Minister, recommendation 50 of the bushfire inquiry was that the Commonwealth trial the feasibility of retrofitting RAAF C-130 aircraft with modular airborne firefighting systems. Now, the New South Wales government also supported this recommendation. Will the government support such a trial, and if not, why not? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, the government obviously um, is very keen to investigate all options to make sure that we have a, a full capacity um, for our firefighters um, come fire season. But um, we have. Uh, it's been very clear that the ADF is not trained to be, uh, or equipped, or certified to undertake um, firefighting, whether it be um, on-ground firefighting or aerial bushfire fighting. Um, so uh, civilian aircraft that are used for aerial firefighting are significantly modified for the purpose of firefighting, uh, and Defence's transport aircraft fleet is primarily configured uh, for airlift missions to support military activities, which are terribly important when it comes to uh, assisting our firefighting activities. Uh, however, um, whilst of course we're going to look at all the recommendations that exist in the interim report, as we will in the final report, um, clearly uh, the ADF's capability is much better suited for on-ground activity because of the extraordinary requirements Order. of modification. Senator Rustin, Senator McAllister. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. In its response to the final report on the Newmarch House COVID-19 outbreak, the Liberal New South Wales government determined, and I quote, neither the Commonwealth nor Anglicare Executive had an operational plan for how the residents should be managed. Why did the minister fail to have a COVID-19 plan for aged care? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and as we've discussed a number of times in this chamber, Mr. President, there are order. There are responsibilities uh, of varying parties with respect to who controls what particular matters, Mr. President. Uh, and as uh, is as I've said before in the chamber, the responsibility for the public health response to an age to a COVID-19 aged care outbreak. Lies Order. with the state governments, Mr. President, and and that's and that that information, Mr. President, is actually confirmed in the agreement that we have published on the New South Wales uh, uh, Health Department website and ours that uh, the, the public health response lies with the with the uh, New South Wales government, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, aged care providers are all provided required to have uh, order. Uh, an Senator, infection control management plan. Senator McAllister on a point of order. Senator McAllister. Uh, Mr President, my point of order goes to relevance. I asked about why there was a failure to plan. So far I've heard about a public health response, and I would ask you to uh, ask the minister to return to the question. Um, I'm listening carefully to the minister, 
Um, that was the end of the question. I appreciate the preamble was quite narrow. I I'm unwilling to say to go to the exact terminology a minister uses to rule on direct relevance, whether it be a response or a plan, but I will continue to listen carefully. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Under the National COVID-19 Health Plan, which was released early in March, uh, the, that, that plan, which contemplates a range of health responses, including for those in residential aged care, supported by supported by Mr President the uh, the CDNA guidelines Order which provide on advice my left. to age to residential Order. aged care providers on how they will establish themselves to uh, to manage a covid-19 outbreak uh, all of these things are the, all of these things are uh, considered Mr President so so our plan Order. backed up Mr President Senator by Watt. the uh, the national the national covid-19 health plan Launched in, Order in, on in, my in, left. launched in, in uh, March of this year, supported by the CDNA guidelines, uh, and, and it contemplates, Mr. President, the, co the, the cooperation between state and Commonwealth in the management and the public health management of a COVID-19 outbreak, and that's exactly what occurred at Newmarch. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. In its response, the Liberal New South Wales government also found, and I quote. Anglicare had difficulty acquiring adequate supplies from the Commonwealth Government medical stockpile. Although the provision of PPP is the responsibility of the Commonwealth Government, New South Wales Health stepped in to provide this equipment. Isn't this yet another failure, another example of the Morrison Government's neglect of aged care and its failure to take responsibility to fix it? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And as the National COVID-19 Health Response Plan contemplates. Uh, the, the national government provided, uh, provides, uh, and, 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 and this government built a significant stockpile of PPE at a time of global shortage. Uh, we, we do support residential aged care, Mr. President, and we do that in cooperation with state governments, Mr. President. Uh, and in fact, m much of the PPE is channelled through state government services to providers around the country. So this is not an either-or situation, Mr. President. Both the Commonwealth and the states support residential aged care providers, uh, and that's what occurred in this particular circumstance, Mr. President. Uh, we, we, New South Wales provided support directly to Newmarch, and we backfilled their stockpile, stockpile Mr. President. So there is a cooperation, and there was a cooperation at, at Newmarch, and, and Mr. President. Uh, my conversations on a regular basis order, with Order, Senator Colbeck. Order, order. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. If even the New South Wales Liberal government, led by Premier Berejik Klien, a state which the Prime Minister commended last week as being, and I quote, the gold standard, doesn't have confidence in the Morrison government's handling of aged care, why should anyone else? Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr President. It, it's, Labor never ceased to put words into other people's mouths, as Mr. Mouth, Mr. President. Uh, they just make things up, uh, assert that Order. somebody else might have implied them or said them, uh, and then bring them into question time, Mr. President. Mr. President, all through New March, uh, the New South Wales Health Minister and I were in regular discussion to ensure that we were both asking the questions that needed to be asked to, to ensure the, provi the provider had resources in every sense that they required. In fact, Mr President, uh, we worked extremely closely together to ensure that occurred. It was a very cooperative, a cooperative process. Well, that's a lie, Senator uh, Keneally. That is a lie. Because I spoke Order. to— Order. Senator— Just my interjection, so I ask your indulgence to correct the record. You should— Sen um, You don't get— Order. Order. Um, you don't get to correct the record. You don't get to correct the record via a point of order. Um, I'm going to carefully review what he said, only because I, I heard a word there that would normally be unparliamentary, but it depends if it was directed at someone personally. Okay, I'll take Senator. I'll ask Senator Colbeck. I'll ask you to withdraw that. If it, will, that, assist, that, if it will assist, I will withdraw. Mr. President, but I had, Thank you. I, I had very regular conversations and discussions with uh, Minister Hazard to ensure that uh, services and were, were provided oh, at, yeah. uh, at Newmarch House. Uh, it, was, it was very much a cooperative process. 
uh, all through that, all through the COVID-19 outbreak at uh, Newmarch House. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister advise the Senate as to the immediate financial services that are available for Australians who have suffered from the economic consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes um, for her question. Um, clearly, many Australians have found um, themselves in very, very challenging circumstances as a result of the COVID pandemic. And many of those people may need now or into the future access to financial tools to assist them to make stable and safe financial decisions going forward. Um, to make sure that people get the advice that they need, um, we have made a available an additional $20 million to scale up the capacity of our existing financial counselling services in Australia. Um, of that, we have provided $6 million to Financial Counselling Australia. And we did this most particularly because we wanted to make sure that they had the ability to be able to train more interns so that they could get them through their financial um, uh, counselling traineeship so they could get out on the ground and could start assisting Australians who need them. This has allowed us to be able to fast track the, the time frame in which we are able to get these uh, students accredited. Uh, and so far, I'm pleased to say that 70 agencies have agreed to employ these students to make sure that they are able to get the hands on experience they need to be able to get their qualifications. So, um, increasing the capacity of the workforce to the sector means that we, as, as, a, as a country, are in a position to be able to respond to what we expect to be. Uh, an increased demand. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to remind all Australians um, that the supports that have been put in place are there to assist Australians to make sure that, that when they go through the difficult times that clearly many Australians are going to have to go through um, over coming months, that the, the resources are there, the, fi the um, confidential um, free advice is available to them. Um, and so I would recommend that anybody who finds themselves in difficult financial circumstances make yourself uh, a contact uh, a financial advisor and get the kind of advice you need to assist you in Order, your negotiations. Senator, Rustin. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, how is the Morrison government building capacity in the financial counselling sector over the longer term to support vulnerable Australians? Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, well, well, clearly, part of our response to the COVID pandemic has been around making sure uh, that we provide the resources to the financial counselling sector into the future, not just to deal with the COVID pandemic, which we know um, is going to put many people into financial difficulty, uh, but also to make sure that, in an ongoing sense, that we have the kind of capacity and capability built into our financial counselling services so that they are able to assist Australians going on into the future. Uh, and certainly would like to, to recognise uh, the huge work that was undertaken through the Sylvan report, uh, where recommendations were made about providing greater capacity in the longer term. Um, and it was, uh, it was probably very timely that this capacity was being built uh, and we were providing additional funding to, to the financial and counselling sector to build that capacity, because when the COVID pandemic um, has, had hit, we realised that the need for those services was going to be very strong. So we will continue as a government to invest in financial counselling services Order. to assist Australians, no matter what the Senator circumstance. Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate how no-interest loans are assisting Australians through the pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, part of the suite of measures that are available to us um, through the financial counselling um, mechanisms that occur in Australia um, are through no-interest loans. Um, and as part of our COVID uh, response package, we have increased the amount of money that's available to Good Shepherd Microfinance, who have been delivering loans, uh, no-interest loans, to Australians for many, many years. Um, but the most important reason uh, that we wanted to make sure that we provided this money was to enable them to be able to leverage that money up with other providers. And can I acknowledge uh, the National Bank of Australia, um, who have uh, made available $40 million worth of loan capital 
on the back of the support that the Australian government has been put into to these microfinance loans to make sure that loans of up to $3,000 are made available to people to pay for such things as essential household products that they may need, the payment of bills, and it also gives them the capacity to access high, um, so to, to an alternative to high-risk, high-interest products and Order. safe and Senator stable Rustin, way. Uh, we're now going to the screens. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Does the Minister agree with Council assisting the Aged Care Royal Commission, Mr. Peter Rosen QC, that the stories of large scale death in aged care homes in the Northern Hemisphere in February and March meant the Australian aged care sector and the government agencies that fund and regulate it were on notice about the particular vulnerability? Of the elderly residents in our own in our own care homes. The Minister for Aged Care and Senior yes. Australia, yes. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, the government uh, and the uh, health officers, the CMOs, the CHOs from around around the country were all very well aware that uh, senior Australians were extremely vulnerable to this terrible virus, COVID-19. We all very much knew that. Uh, uh, it was going. It could have a devastating impact. Uh, we all knew that, Mr. President, and that's why, in in our plan to deal with COVID-19 in this country, including in aged care, uh, the, the, the the national COVID-19 health care plan, uh, aged care was uh, a a significant component, Mr. President, and that's why the uh, the aged PPC uh, put that document together to support the government's response to. COVID-19 across the country, including in aged care, supported, Mr. President, by the guidelines that were provided by the CDNA to, uh, uh, to the aged care sector, all part of our plan, Mr. Order. President, to deal with COVID-19 across the country. So, Mr. President, from the beginning uh, of the year, from January, we started working closely with the aged care pro sector, providing them with advice on how they would improve their infection control plans how they should upgrade their procedures with respect to the utilisation of PPE, how they should upgrade their, the plans within their uh, facilities so that they could be prepared in the circumstance of an outbreak. And Mr. President, and the Aged Care uh, and, and the Quality and Safety Commission also started working with providers to test their pre preparedness. Mr. President. So, yes, uh, we were well aware Mr. President, of the vulnerabilities of the aged care sector and those uh, who reside within it, very well aware, and that's why our plan, right from the outset, contemplated a number of actions based on the, the AHPP, HPPC advice through the COVID-19 health management plan that was issued in the beginning of at, in, during February. Order, Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Given the warnings of Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and Newmarch House in April. Why did the minister still wait until June to advise, advise aged care providers that 80 to 100 per cent of their workforce may need to isolate in a major outbreak? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. In fact, the advice, the, the advice on what a, an aged care provider might expect to have to replace uh, with, of its own staff was contained in the, the early advice from the CDNA, Mr. President, back in March this year, which was published in March this year, Mr. President. So, 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 so that that contemplated, Order. Mr. President, that contemplated that an aged care provider might that that contemplated, Order Mr. On President, my left. that Senator a provider Keneally, might Senator be Watt, required Senator to Wong. that that contemplated, Mr. President, that a provider might be required to replace 30 to 40 per cent of its of its uh, workforce that they might be required to isolate, Mr. President. But what we saw Order. as the pandemic as the pand pandemic proceeded, Mr. President, was the circumstances at Newmarch where that number grew significantly, Mr. President. And in fact, even even the report into Newmarch uh, said uh, that we received said that that level of staff Order. isolation Senator was Colbert, not contemplated. Time for the answer has be. expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. This minister was warned of the need to bolster the aged care workforce in the 2018 Aged Care Workforce Strategy, the October 2019 Aged Care Royal Commission Interim Report entitled Neglect, 
the early aged care outbreaks. Again and again, the minister ignored the warnings and failed to act. How can Australians in aged care and their families possibly have confidence in this minister? Order. Senator Colbert. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say I completely reject the premise of the question, Mr. President? We acted very quickly to bolster the aged care workforce through our surge capacity, which we announced on the 11th of March this year, Mr. President. So we 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 acted very quickly before DHL was at Dorothy Henderson Lodge was over. We we acted extremely quickly because we saw what had happened. We'd received the advice of uh, the AHPPC, and so we put in place our over $100 million in, in capacity for work, work, surge workforce uh, early in March, Mr President. So I completely reject the premise of the question. We acted quickly, Mr President, to make sure the resources were available to residential aged care in this country that, so that any facility that was impacted had the capacity to, uh, could be, to, to be supported by the government in the form that it needed to continue to provide quality care. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. How many residents of aged care facilities, funded and regulated by the Morrison government, have passed away from COVID-19? How many active cases of COVID-19 are there currently in Australia's aged care system? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. So, as of uh, eight o'clock this morning, there were 462 Australians who had passed away uh, across Australia from COVID-19, Mr. President, and there were uh, 876. Order. Um, You're a corrupt. Order. 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 Sorry, you know, please resume your order. seat. Um, there were. It is unhelpful for interjections at all times, particularly when they are of that nature and they descend across the chamber. While I'm talking, I ask senators to remain quiet. Senator Colbeck to continue. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Point of order. Um, Senator Rennick um, used a um, called, sorry, Senator McGrath called um, Senator O'Neill a term that I would imagine is extremely unparliamentary and should be asked to withdraw. Um, I, I, there were so many interjections I didn't hear. I'm going to offer the opportunity for anyone to withdraw if it would assist the chamber. I withdraw. Thank you. I didn't hear the word, but thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, as, as at uh, the same time, there are uh, 876 residents who are currently um, positive within uh, residential aged care in Australia. Uh, and, uh, 252 staff members, Mr. President. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Last Thursday, the minister told the Senate he first realised he hadn't got it right, and I quote him: "When the circumstances at St. Basil's occurred in the way that they did, it was clearly obvious to me that we didn't get it right. Given that there have been now more than 400 deaths in aged care from COVID-19 since this minister first realised he." hadn't got it right. How many more deaths will occur on this minister's watch before he finally gets it right? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Sen Senator Wong attempts to make a very, very unfortunate correlation uh, between the circumstances that occurred at uh, St Basil's, Order. Mr President. Uh, Ms. Where Mr. Order President on my left. make a very, very unfortunate and I, and I think dishonest correlation between the circumstances at St Basil's, where the government has acknowledged that with 24 hours' notice we didn't have in place the staffing requirements to replace the entire staff of that facility, uh, and, and there were some things that occurred there uh, that we would, would have wished had not occurred, Mr. President. Mr. President the Labor Party seem to, to exist in this little Order global on bubble where they don't understand that there is a global pandemic of COVID-19 occurring. Order there is significant community left. transmission in Order. Victoria, Mr. President. There is significant community transmission Senator Colbert, of COVID-19 in the time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Mr President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the censure of the Minister, of, of the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians as circulated in the Chamber. Leave is not granted. Senator Wong. 
I seek, I presume to concede contingent notice standing in my name. I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to give precedence to a motion of censure of the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Mr President. Mr President, this is a motion which goes to the failure of this minister to take responsibility for the devastating crisis in the aged care sector, which has caused death, grief and untold trauma for vulnerable Australians in, their, in Australia, vulnerable Australians and their families. And we move this motion, Mr President, because ministers are accountable to the parliament. Ministers are accountable to the parliament. And despite the protection racket being run by Mr Morrison, Senator Colbeck is accountable to this Senate. And Senator Colbeck has been found wanting. How much grief and loss must be suffered by Australians as a result of the incompetence of this minister? When the incompetence of a minister is measured in the sum of lives lost, when the most vulnerable of our older Australians are the victims of this neglect, when does this chamber say someone must be held accountable? When the consequences for Australian families is the death of a loved one, the consequence for the minister responsible cannot simply be a shrug. And I'll take that interjection. You know what is shameless? His failure to take responsibility and your involvement in the protection racket. That is what is shameless. That is what is shameful, because a minister cannot simply absolve himself of responsibility by shrugging and blaming somebody else. He cannot absolve himself of responsibility for deaths by neglect simply saying that that is a function of aged care, because the deaths by neglect are a function of the neglect of aged care by this government. 1.7 billion ripped from aged care by Mr Morrison when he was Treasurer. A situation so dire, Mr Morrison was forced to call a Royal Commission into their own mismanagement of aged care. A Royal Commission that summarised this government's care of older Australians in the title of its interim report, Neglect. Warnings from overseas where aged care was ravaged well before COVID-19 took hold here. Warnings from experts and unions representing carers. Carers given one glove, one glove and having to choose which hand to put it on. Warnings from tragedies already experienced in Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House in New South Wales. And warnings that have still not been acted upon. Had still have not been acted upon by a government that even now has not produced a COVID-19 plan for aged care. Despite more than 460 aged care residents on today's figures having died, having died, the Royal Commission has said that if this government had acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the suffering of many Australians could have been avoided. And yet, even now, this minister ignores the Royal Commission. Yesterday, this government made more announcements. Senator Colbeck, like Mr Morrison, he loves to list his announcements. But you know what? Announcements don't save lives. It's delivery that matters. It's follow-up that matters. And until Senator Colbeck delivers on the recommendations of the Royal Commission, the one word which will always come to mind at the sound of this minister's name is neglect. Neglect. The Royal Commission has warned Senator Colbeck it will take an additional $620 million per year to improve the aged care system. And once again, this minister ignores yet another warning. He says, we'll wait and see what the report says, what the final report says. Well, when lives are on the line, when the neglect is the in the Morrison government's aged care system is clear, why is this minister putting off until later what he knows older Australians need today? But ultimately, this neglect is not just on Senator Colbeck. It's also on Mr Morrison. And we will soon see if it is on every senator opposite. Will they be part of the protection racket Mr Morrison is running for Senator Colbeck? Will they be part of that? Because if they are, the neglect of our most vulnerable older Australians, it is in this minister's name 
It is in Senator Colbeck's name. But you know what? It is not just in Senator Colbeck's name. It is in the name of each and every senator who shields him from accountability. Who shields him from accountability. There is no one on that side who has confidence in this minister anymore. The Senate should do the right thing and censure Order. this minister. Order. 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 I call Senator Cormann. Senator Watt and Rennick. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Senator Richard Colbeck has worked flat out, absolutely flat out, to, be, to do the best he can to ensure Order. that those residents uh, in aged care facilities across Australia are safe. Listening to the Labor Party, you, you, you'd think that somehow there is no pandemic happening anywhere. Listening to the Labor Party, you think that all of this is happening in isolation of any context whatsoever. Senators, uh, Mr. President, through you, Mr. President, of course, every passing of a loved one is tragic. And the minister, like all of us, and like every senator in this chamber, of course, uh, are deeply empathetic for the grief felt by families who lose a loved one, in particular in circumstances where they, sadly, because of the restrictions that have had to be imposed to keep everybody else in the community safe, pass away on their own. Of course that is, of course that is tragic. But, Mr. President, the reason we have a particular aged care problem in Victoria is because we have a COVID problem in Victoria. It's because Order. we have a COVID problem in Victoria. Order. If you look at the Order, if you, Senator Cormann, please resume. Senator Cormann, that, that is Senator a fact. Cormann, that Senator is a Cormann, fact. I'll ask you to resume your seat for a moment, Senator Cormann. Not your fault. I cannot hear a word. Your quite loud voice is capable of um, dominating the chamber. I need to be able to hear the minister. I ask for compliance with the standing orders, and if not complete compliance, then at least at a level of the volume that I can hear the minister. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. It might be an inconvenient truth, and it might interfere with your base political strategy in this chamber, but it is a fact nevertheless. It is a fact nevertheless. And here is Senator Wong using, using the sad passing of Australians as a political weapon. As a Order. political weapon, you should be ashamed of Order. yourself, Senator, Senator Wong. You should be Order. ashamed of yourself. Across the chamber. As tragic, as tragic as the passing of any Australian in their circumstances Order. is in Australia by any measure, in Australia by any measure, despite what's going on in Victoria, we are in a comparatively better position. And you know what? You know what? You know what? I, I, I would. I, I, would, I would challenge you, I would challenge you to look at what's happening in the United Kingdom, what's happening in the United States, what is happening in a whole range of, in a whole range of comparable jurisdictions and compare the performance of our aged care system with the performance of the aged care system in other parts of the world. Now, and, and here again, we get the political attack. How much is all right? None Order. Of course, we, of course, we want to absolutely minimize the risk. But to suggest that in the context of a global pandemic, which is costing lives all around the world, which is having a devastating impact all around the world, to suggest that somehow this minister is to blame because of what is happening in individual aged care facilities is absolutely and utterly unreasonable. And let me tell you, I have admired Senator Cole Fortnight. I have absolutely admired him. He has stood here calmly with his usual compassion, with his usual de dedication to the job. He's been directly accountable. He's Order been answering all of your left. questions. He has ignored your political Senator provocations. Watt. I mean, you, you here Senator are here Watt. trying to use and abuse the tragedy of Senator individual Watt. Australians as, your, as, as, a, as a political weapon, as a desperate political weapon. And it is a sad Order reflection, on not just left. on Labor senators in this chamber, it is a sad reflection on the Labor Party under the leadership of Anthony Albanese. You should collectively be ashamed of yourself. You should collectively be ashamed of yourself. Our government and this minister will continue to do what we have done every single day during this pandemic. And that is make judgments about the best way forward in very difficult circumstances. I've sat there in ERC as this minister has come forward with, with measure after measure to strengthen our capacity to respond Order. to what is a very difficult circumstance. You haven't seen that clearly. I mean, this, this, 
this minister could be walking on water and you would still be finding uh, reasons to criticise him because he can't swim. This, I mean, the truth is, you will, you will, you will try. You've seen an opportunity. There was, there was, there was a clumsy, there was a clumsy moment captured on television. And I know, and the minister has apologised for not having a set of numbers at his fingertips at that time. And that is, that is, that is what you have used. That is what you have used to pursue a bias political partisan political campaign uh, this is this is not this is not about you genuinely caring about what is right and what is wrong this is about you pursuing the political partisan political interests of the labor party and you should be seriously ashamed of yourself on this side of the chamber we understand that we are dealing with a very serious challenge we will continue to do the best we can to ensure that all Australians have the best opportunity to get through this period safely. We are sad that some Australians, in the context Order, of the global pandemic, Senator will sadly— Corman. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Colbeck is not the Order. Minister for Aged Care. He is the Minister for Walking Away. He walked away from this chamber when we were moving our motion the other day. Order he on my away right. From the media conference Order. yesterday, refusing to answer questions from the media about the age care crisis. He is the minister who walks away from interviews, who walks away from this chamber. Order. Quite frankly, the only place Minister Colbeck should be walking is back to his office to clear his desk and resign. Too slow. Too late. That is this government's response to the COVID-19 crisis in aged care. When John Howard was prime minister, when there was one kerosene bath incident, what happened to Bronwyn Bishop, the minister for aged care? She was gone. Right now, we have evidence from the Royal Commission that he has presided over. In fact, it's not just evidence. It is a report from the Royal Commission into aged care. This minister has presided over a, a system of what? Neglect. He has presided over a system of neglect. Neglect that meant when we had an aged care crisis hit with COVID-19, he had no plan. Don't take my word for it. Take Gladys Berejiklian's word for it, the Liberal Premier of New South Wales. And don't just take my word for it, Mr. President. Take the Royal Commission evidence that has made clear that in no way, shape or form was the aged care system ready for a highly contagious virus that was going to devastate older Australians. One kerosene bath and the minister is gone under John Howard. 462 deaths, 876 active cases, workers who only have one glove, aged care residents who have ants in open sores, who are malnourished, who are suffering physical abuse, who have maggots in their mouth. I will take that interjection from the Senator Payne. She said, how did that happen? It is in the Royal Commission's report titled Neglect. It is clear that the cabinet ministers in this government have not even read the Royal Commission report called Neglect. The minister didn't just have one clumsy moment, Senator Cormann. He couldn't even remember if he had briefed the cabinet yes. on the Royal Commission report called Neglect. So neglectful is he of his responsibilities, Mr. President. But we know under this Morrison government, older Australians are being left behind. Older Australians are being ignored. And older Australians are being neglected by the Morrison government, specifically by this minister, Richard Colbeck. Now, I want to say to those people watching at home, when you hear us in here talking about the word neglect, it is not just a word the Labour Party invented. Right. It is the word, it is the title of the Royal Commission's report into aged care the, the, that there was established by this government. Now, day in and day out, we have seen the minister in this place really puffing himself up. He talked about the high watermark that Australia has achieved. Unbelievable. He talked about the fact that, quote, the system has performed exceptionally well. Well, it's not exceptionally well if your family member is one of the 462 people who have died, if your family member is one of the over 800 active cases in aged care. How do you think it feels to the son or the daughter to hear the minister in this government gloating? 
about how well it's all going out there, about what a high watermark Australian aged care is. I mean, come on. When is this minister going to take some accountability? Where does the buck stop in this government? All we have heard today, it's New South Wales government's fault. It's the Victorian government's fault. It's the regulator's fault. It's anybody's fault but his. What we know about this uh, Minister for Aged Care is he follows the example set by his Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who never accepts responsibility, who hates accountability, and is all about the photo op and the announcement, but never about the follow-through. Never about the follow-through. Well, if there is one group of Australians who should have been able to rely on their government to look after them, it is the vulnerable and the precious senior citizens, our elderly, who live in residential aged care homes, and they have been failed by this minister, and the, sen the Senate should censure this minister for failing to do his job. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to call the minister, then I'll go to Senator Seward. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I say it is really quite tragic that the Labor Party seeks to say, play such base politics with, Order. With, what is, with what is a completely and utterly national tragedy, Mr. President? Order. Uh, as, as we've indicated, there, there are, Mr. Mr. President, uh, there, there are 462 Australians. Senator Cormann. This is a very serious point of order. I mean, we, we sat here in comparative silence. We did, during your contribution and during yours. This is a very serious matter. This is a central motion debate. And to have the Leader of the Opposition and various other senior frontbenchers continuously aggressively interject, it is out of, it's out of order at the best of times, but it is particularly inappropriate and a very low way of operating at this point in time. I, I, I'm taking the traditionally um, liberal view of motions to suspend standing orders for the purposes of a censure debate allow certain material. I do, after an initial flurry, there was general silence from the government side compared to the previous address. The minister in particular sat there and listened to the speeches in silence. I am, going to, I am going to say the standing orders here have a place and I have to be able to hear the minister speak, which I was having trouble doing. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. It is, it is, it is tragic that the Labor Party t uh, takes to play such base politics with what is a really tragic issue, Mr President. 462 deaths in this country so far. Uh, unfortunately, because of the infection rates, there will be more. Uh, and, Mr President, as the Leader in the, of the Government in the Senate has said, uh, there, there are correlations to the level of community spread, as the Government has said, as many experts have acknowledged, between the, the level of community spread, the level of infection in the community and the level of infection that will occur in residential aged care, Mr President. And if you want to uh, overlay the statistics, uh, there is a direct correlation, Mr. President, and unfortunately, and unfortunately in, uh, in in Victoria, we had a situation where we got to the, the circumstance where there were over 700 infections every day in Victoria, Mr. President, and unfortunately, some of those people who were infected in the community uh, were working in residential aged care, and, Mr. President. Uh, the only way that you completely protect residential aged care from that community transmission is to completely isolate it, Mr. President. Uh, and that's not been done anywhere in the world. But, Mr. President, when you consider that 97% uh, of the facilities in this country have not had a case of COVID-19 that has infected a, a resident, uh, Mr. President, uh, it demonstrates that a large number of aged care prov providers in this country uh, have been well prepared, Mr. President. A large number of them. There are a few, there are a few, about 20 odd, that have had significant infections, tragically significant infections, Mr. President. Uh, and, we've, and, and Mr. President, uh, as was put to me by one of the uh, uh, clinical experts in infection control and uh, infectious diseases, by the time the infection, the first case is discovered, the infection has largely occurred, Mr. President. So it's a, quite, it's a very tragic circumstance, and I have issued my condolences, Mr. President, on a number of occasions to all of the families who are involved, Mr. President, uh, and, and for their loss, for their extremely tragic loss. Every single death is a tragedy. In fact, every case I wish in this country had never occurred. But we are living in a global pandemic, Mr. President, and governments at all levels uh, are struggling with this. 
uh, and we continue to work every day, uh, every day to ensure that we provide the resources and the capacity to protect senior Australians in residential aged care. And we continue to do that, Mr. President. Mr. President, the Labor Party can misrepresent, misrepresent my words, my actions in any way they like. It's not going to change the facts, Mr. President. It is not going to change the facts. This government set out its plan for dealing with COVID-19 very early in the outbreak. We started working with the sector extremely earlier, and we did act, and we continued to work with the sector to improve the capacity to provide them with additional resources. Mr. President, in fact, over $1.5 billion of resources have been supplied to this sector to ensure that it has the resources available and the capacity to assist us to work with them to, to, to look after the residents in residential aged care in this, in this country, Mr. President. Mr. President, I reject the base politics that Labor is attempting to play with this. Mr. President, every single death, every single death is an absolute tragedy. And I know that from the health professionals at the AHPPC and the CDNA right down through all members of the government, they have been working every day to ensure that Australians more broadly, but also Australians who are residing in aged care uh, have the best chance, uh, have the best level of resource available so that we can continue to protect them. And Mr President, the Labor Party scoff at our national performance, but on a global scale, uh, we have, as a country, performed extremely well, Mr President. You only need to look at our capacity uh, and, and the level of COVID-19 in this country. And I have to say, Mr President, I would rather be here in this country than almost any other country in the world. And in the respect of residential aged care, Mr President, it's the same. Mr President, in the UK, over 20,000 deaths, Mr President, each one of them a tragedy. But also, one, all of the 462 in this, in this country is also a tragedy. The Greens will be supporting this censure. We are sick of having Australia compared to the global situations. Australians are sick of hearing that. They are desperately upset that so many people have died in aged care in this country. We are sick of hearing that there was a plan when, quite obviously, there was no plan. No plan. You rip, you rip a cover off one report and stick another one on and said, here's our plan. The planning folks included self-assessment by providers of their preparedness for the pandemic. Self-assessment. And guess what? Most of them said, we're, we're prepared. Well, quite obviously, they were not. We should have had people in these facilities from the beginning. We should have made sure that infectious disease control training was mandatory and not online. It's come to the point where we've got the, the defence forces there in these homes, residential facilities, providing the training that should have been provided from the start. I will admit that the scene for this has been set a long time ago. It just didn't suddenly happen. The fact that we don't have sufficient number of care, uh, uh, hours, provision of hours of care for a start, the fact that we don't have enough workforce in place, the fact that we don't even have minimum standards in residential aged care for staffing ratios has set the scene. The fact that the funding for the provision of care hasn't been dealt with is also set the scene. The fact that we haven't got it right with clinical care the balance of that provided in aged care is also a factor here. But the fact is that we knew that if, a, if COVID got into aged care facilities, it was going to have a devastating impact. We did. Where I will accept international comparisons is where we look and see what happened. There have been facilities that have kept it out. All the facilities in this country should have had an audit, not a self-assessment, should have had an audit, should have been prepared for, a pandem for this pandemic, for the fact that it might get into the facilities, the fact that more staff needed training, and make sure we had sufficient PPE so people weren't having to share masks, weren't, weren't having to just use one glove, and knew how to use it. And then we had the excuse, folks, that oh, the staff were catching it in, that were bringing it in 
and that's where residents were catching it from. When in fact, we know that healthcare workers are predominantly have caught it in the workplace and weren't bringing it in to the aged care facilities. This has not been handled. We didn't have a plan. We don't have a, a system that's set up to protect workers. And now, all of a sudden, we will have someone that's looking after and ensuring in facilities that we have infectious disease control in place. Now, now we put it in place. Why wasn't it there from the beginning? Making sure that we had somebody checking that. We get accused of base politics. It is base politics not to accept and acknowledge that you did not have a plan, that you weren't prepared, that you didn't learn the lessons internationally. The fact that the regulator does not have enough staff, the regulator has not been there doing its job, also needs to be strongly considered and factored in here. A regulator, a strong regulator in place, a strong cop on the beat, would have also helped to ensure that this did not happen. The fact that we have so many notices now in place on these facilities that have had a lot of infection and that have had a lot of deaths, again, points to the failure of the regulatory process. And it's not as if we haven't been warned. I'll keep saying it, 35 reports over 40 years. A lot here under the watch of this government this was not inevitable, and I will not have it said that it was inevitable. It wasn't. We could have done more, and we should have done more. Yeah. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The opposition uh, does not move this suspension lightly. In fact, um, you know, we uh, we have been asking questions of this minister, holding him to account for the last four, five question times following his appearance before the Select Committee. We have been holding him to account. We get accused of base politics. It's not base politics to require that a minister does his job properly. The minister has failed to lead. He's failed to plan. He's failed to protect. He's failed to take responsibility. He has failed to provide an environment where the appropriate level of care is provided to older Australians. Since this outbreak in Victoria occurred, we have seen cases grow from just a few cases in aged care to when it peaked at over 2,000 across 125 aged care facilities, where we had older Australians trolleyed out of their homes into ambulances and taken to private hospitals because the system was broken. We had older Australians malnourished, dehydrated, soiled. They hadn't eaten for at least 24 hours. They hadn't had their medication. Their families didn't know where they were. The people providing care to them didn't know who they were. This is the system that this minister oversaw, and this is why we are holding you to account, because people are angry, people are upset, people go into aged care because they think they're going to be protected. They think that the environment of residential aged care will help their loved ones, will care for them, will keep them safe. The minister told the select committee that he was first worried about community transmission levels rising in Victoria in mid-June. In mid-June. But action in aged care didn't happen until cases were well underway, staff had it, working across multiple facilities. The Victorian Aged Care Response Centre wasn't established until 23 July. By then, there was more than 100 outbreaks thousands of cases, hundreds hospitalised, and the death count was increasing. And today we hear 462 Australians have succumbed to COVID-19—462 in residential aged care in a system that this minister is in charge of. And that's why we're having this debate today. That's why. It's not trivial. It's not base politics. It's real. It's 462 families who entrusted their loved one to the care of the aged care system, and it failed them. And the other thing is, you were warned. 
That's the other thing that I think makes people angry. Not just what has happened, but the fact that this government was warned. It was warned in October. This minister couldn't tell the select committee whether or not he had briefed the cabinet on a report titled Neglect. He couldn't recall if he'd been invited in to the decision-making table to the people that run this government. He couldn't recall if he had briefed them on neglect. You were warned. You were warned. You were warned in October. You were warned every three months by the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission. Every three months they told you this system is failing. More than half of their site audits failing, 100 per cent of the review audits failing. And what happened? Oh, well, we'll wait for the next one, shall we? See what happens. And the standard that was most not met was personal and clinical care. Shame. Personal and clinical care for older Australians. That means the showering, the getting medication, the being cared for, the meals, the care. That's what failed. And this minister did nothing. And then he got Dorothy Henderson Lodge. And then he got Newmarch. And then he'd seen what happened in, in um, Northern Hemisphere. And still, we just kicked along and waited as community transmission rates uh, grew. And you blame the Victorian government. You blame the New South Wales government. You blame the regulator. Well, this motion today, and hopefully the Senate supports it, is about your actions and your responsibility and your accountability for the job that you have. And it's hard. No one's saying it's not hard. But we expect you to be able to do your job. And if you can't do your job, get out of the way and give it to someone who can do the job, because older Australians deserve that. Order. Yeah. The question is that standing orders be suspended uh, according to the contingent notice moved in the name of Senator Wong. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes. Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of division is ayes 24, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the negative. I call Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Thank you. Motions to take note of answers. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And may I indicate that someone has left their phone here unlocked. Thank you, Senator McAllister. To retrieve it. it is honest of me, is it not? All right. I rise to take note of answers. Uh, to questions to Minister Colbeck asked by Labor. Well, early in the pandemic, Senator Colbeck announced a scheme that was supposed to deliver 36,000 food boxes to older Australians who were unable to shop safely because of COVID. Just 38 of those 36,000 boxes were ultimately delivered. And when asked about it in this chamber, Senator Colbeck perversely insisted that he regarded this as a success. Well, it should have been a bit of an early warning sign, shouldn't it, about this minister's approach to his job, because that scheme was a failure, and that failure was predictable. The CEO of the Council of the Ageing explained that he was not surprised that this occurred because the program didn't match what older Australians needed or wanted. Early on, we saw the qualities that have allowed Minister Colbeck to oversee a shocking tragedy in Australia's aged care homes, his refusal to listen to stakeholders and older Australians, his unwillingness to take responsibility for his failures, his determination to deny facts, to call a fork a spoon in the face of overwhelming contrary evidence, and, of course, rank incompetence. You can draw a line from the tragedy that is currently consuming our aged care system to the neglect that the government has shown this sector over their three terms in office. They have failed to respond to the recommendations from the many inquiries before them. And the commissioners presiding over the Royal Commission said, had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the suffering of many people could have been avoided. And it puts it in perspective, doesn't it, when this government insists that the matters that have unfolded in Victoria were unforeseeable, 
because that's not what experts are telling them. It's not what the Royal Commission is telling them. Senator Keneally asked earlier in the week and today how many older Australians have died from neglect. Well, what was the answer today? How would we define this? Well, there's plenty of sources of evidence that could be used to define this. And the minister could go, for example, to the reports that have piled up on his desk quarter after quarter after quarter, the reports that found that between October and December last year standards were not met in 45 per cent of the site audits and 100 per cent of the review audits. The reports that landed on his desk that said between January and March this year standards were not met in 41 per cent of site audits and 87.5 per cent of review audits. What was the minister's response to these facts? Well, on the basis of his evidence to this chamber today, on the basis of his answers, absolutely nothing. The minister could not point to a single thing he had done, a single action he had taken. But he did revert to type. He did the thing he has done on every occasion when he's been called to account for his failures, and that is to blame somebody else. So today he blamed the regulator. But in his answers, Question after question after question. In his answers, there was always somebody to blame. If it wasn't the Aged Care Quality and Safety Regulator, it was the Victorian state government. Or it was the New South Wales state government, because he didn't like their scathing critique of his mishandling. It was the Aged Care Facilities themselves. It was the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee. There's always somebody, somebody other than this minister, this minister who cannot point in any concrete way to a thing he has done. This minister who can't remember the occasions on which he's engaged the National Cabinet or the Commonwealth Cabinet on these questions. And the consequence of this unwillingness to accept his responsibility for managing this system and managing this crisis has been a complete unwillingness to learn from mistakes and listen to experts. Experts knew that aged care facilities would struggle to find staff during a coronavirus outbreak, but nothing was done. We knew this from Newmarch House in my home state of New South Wales, but the government, this minister, knew nothing, did nothing, did not have a plan to prevent this from happening in Victoria. The great shame of all this is that one of the most incompetent ministers in this government has been left in place by this uncaring Prime Minister to preside over a sector full of vulnerable people who deserved our collective protection. And it is a disgrace. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, it's nice to hear Senator McAllister acknowledge that there is a Victorian government. Because during these continual attacks on Minister Colbeck, these disgraceful efforts targeting some of the most vulnerable people in our community that are being absolutely well protected, they are being put at risk thanks to the efforts of a, uh, a security guard who decided to get a bit of action during uh, you know, his work time, thanks to the outstanding management of quarantine by Chairman Dan, which of course we don't hear any uh, recognition. It is uh, not okay to not use people's proper titles. That extends to state parliaments. I'd ask you to withdraw. I withdraw. My mistake. I actually thought that was his title after the six-month grab uh, of Senator emergency Hughes, powers. Senator Hughes, please resume your seat. Uh, order, order. When I ask you to withdraw, please don't make a reference to your previous comment. I would like you to withdraw and then move on with your speech, please. Thank you. Acting Madam Deputy President, I withdraw. Thank you. So as Premier Andrews continues his grasping for emergency powers as he claims that state of emergency is existing due to his absolutely woeful incompetence, that his management of the quarantine program led to the Victorian second wave, not that those opposite have acknowledged that these terrible tragic deaths that are occurring in aged care homes are because of the second wave. They are occurring in Victoria because of the actions of Premier Andrews and his incompetent cabinet, who are now, thanks to their incredible uh, poor legislative agenda at the beginning of this year, facing staring down the barrel of, of manslaughter charges for their incompetence. 
It's an extraordinary fact that those opposite have continually failed to acknowledge. You wouldn't know there was a state of Victoria. I mean, luckily, you know, for a lot of these people that they, you know, in Victoria, they're locked away, unable to work, trying to stay safe, keep themselves away from the COVID spread, as Premier Andrews gives himself more and more power, increases his reach into people's lives, ruining the Victorian economy. But let's not mention any of that. It is a tragedy when COVID, of course, when it gets into the community, that it is going to get into our aged care facilities. And of course, we have planned for that. And Minister Colbeck has been working across the board to ensure that those preparations and plans were in place, that we have made sure there is a surge workforce available. And incredibly, many of the other state premiers actually suggested and volunteered and offered assistance of workers from their states to go to Victoria. Not that Premier Andrews could be trusted to acknowledge that, particularly after his disgraceful efforts in defaming the ADF and the offers that were made there, where he you know, seems to think that just because you say it on Zoom, it doesn't count as misleading the parliament. But anyway, as is Victoria. But whilst these deaths are incredibly tragic, what is also incredibly tragic is the people that are dying alone. And they're not only dying alone in Victoria. These people are dying alone across the country because of the actions of other Labor premiers who have implemented hard borders, keeping families and loved ones separated uh, during a time where it is absolutely unnecessary, where we have seen an unborn twin die because of medical assistance that was unable to be, to, to be accessed. We are seeing a situation at the moment between Queensland and New South Wales that is absolutely tragic. We have borders at school who are supposed to be going home for school holidays, who are leaving areas in Queensland with no COVID <coughs> and heading to the family property, 15 k's south of the border, 20 k's south of the border, 50 k's south of the border, onto their family properties as harvest kicks off. The first good harvest in a number of years, I'm sure, as Senator Davey will recognise here. Farmers are finally looking like having a good year. But the kids aren't coming home to help drive the headers. Kids aren't coming home to help muster the cattle because they're not allowed back to school under the absolutely ridiculous and overzealous border closures, which everybody can see are politically motivated by uh, Premier Palaszczuk. I wonder what's going to happen on 1 November. I mean, are we going to get a change of heart from Premier Palaszczuk after the election? Let's hope it's former Premier Palaszczuk by 1 November for the sake of all Queenslanders. But, you know, we are seeing so many people being affected, and yet those opposite don't acknowledge what Premier Andrews has done, don't acknowledge the hard borders and the hardship being created for families on the borders thanks to Premier Palaszczuk. We, you know, we certainly wouldn't hear any acknowledgement of Premier McGowan putting electronic trackers on the ankles of those in quarantine. I mean, it is an extraordinary breach of civil human rights, but those opposite who decry all of these things. Thank you, no, Senator not a word. Hughes. Your time has expired. Senator Polly. Nice uh, deflection from the government senator on that side. We don't hear us saying anything about the Tasmanian borders by Premier Gutwin that has closed the borders because he just happens to be a Liberal Premier. But I'm not going to be diverted away from the attention where it should be, and that is the Minister for Neglect. We have seen day after day, day after day, death after death, the minister come in here and accuse the opposition and anyone else who wants to hold him accountable for his responsibilities as a minister for aged care as playing base politics. Well, base politics, for those that are listening, is when you are a minister of the Crown, the buck stops with you. You are responsible, you are accountable and responsible for your portfolio area. And unfortunately, and it is unfortunate, because too many older, vulnerable Australians have died under Minister Colbeck's watch. But it also goes all the way to the top, and that's the Prime Minister. Because what we have known for more years than we can count since these this government has been in power, the Liberals, and that is that the aged care sector has been in crisis. 
We have been calling out for more unannounced visits to residential homes, more unannounced visits. And what have we seen? No action at all by this government. The minister today, in response to questions in relation to whether or not he can confirm that from July to September last year, standards were not met in 37 per cent of site audits and 100 per cent of review audits. What what is he doing? What is this minister doing to restore the confidence of the Australian people that they can have confidence that if their loved one has to go into residential aged care that they're going to be safe? Well, he's not done anything. And today in question time, I really you know how there's some television programs that go call a friend. Well, I was waiting for the minister to call Minister Hunt. Because yesterday it was quite quite extraordinary. In a joint supposed media conference, we had the Minister for Health over talking the Minister for Aged Care, and it was supposed to be an announcement over aged care, putting another band-aid, because we know this government is very, very good at making announcements, having the photo op, but they fail in the delivery. They fail in the delivery. Now we know that there has been warning for month after month that with COVID-19, the impact that was going to have on older residents was going to be enormous. And for older Australians, we're all vulnerable. But if you were in residential aged care, you were more vulnerable than those people in the wider community. Because we know there's been failings of this government for almost eight years to address the training of people who work in this sector. We know that there was not the PPE available to those who are caring for the most vulnerable in our community. We know that compliance failure has been too high, but we've seen nothing but excuses from this minister coming into this chamber, blaming everyone else for his failing as minister. If you accept the portfolio responsibilities, then you have to take responsibilities for the failings. And it's not as if the government and the minister has not been briefed over and over and over again. I've lost count of how many reports there's been into the failings in the aged care sector. But we've had seven ministers in seven years who have each and every one of them has failed to fundamentally fix the very broken system. The fundamental funding of aged care system is broken in this country, and we've waited seven years and have had no action. And now we have a minister who wants to blame everyone else and accuse Labor and anyone who disagrees with him, who wants to hold him accountable, that we're playing base politics. Well, base politics, as I said from the outset, is a minister being responsible for his portfolio area. It's the prime minister who is responsible and gave a commitment at the last federal election that he would make aged care a priority. Well, he has failed dismally. He fails every single day when he doesn't have the Minister for Aged Care in the Cabinet. That's where the Minister for Aged Care belongs. Thank you, Senator Polly. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Madam Deputy President, 462 people have sadly lost their lives in aged care facilities across this country due to COVID-19. 462 we heard today. That is an absolutely tragic number. It represents not just 462 lives but 462 families that right now are grieving, that right now are really, really distraught, no doubt, by the loss of their loved one, whether it be a family member or a friend. And what we've seen here today, and not just today, but for this whole sitting fortnight, time and time again, the Labor Party coming in here and really, I would say, besmirch the, the memory of these individuals and these families that are dealing with it. By coming in here with cheap politics, coming in here with smear, coming in here to, to, to make a political point that ultimately, as much as they can hide behind their their, their bravado and their, their loud noises that they like to make on the other side, 
They're really doing it at the expense of 462 individuals, their families and their loved ones. And they come in here with their confected outrage, but really what they should be doing is actually coming in here and asking questions about what the situation actually is and how things might be improved. No one on this side is saying that all is perfect. No one on this side has said that it's all gone to plan. Of course there have been times throughout this pandemic where we've had to recognise and adapt to the necessary uh, circumstances and changes and, and necessarily adapt to those to make sure that we're uh, responsive and implementing uh, plans in place that uh, are dealing with the, the pandemic. But this is a pandemic. This, these are unusual circumstances. These are unusual times. But the Labor Party doesn't want to acknowledge any of that. And as we heard from Senator, Senator Hughes before, the Labor Party aren't coming in here and mentioning at all this, the source of the pandemic and, and the, the crisis that is, that is prevailing right now in Victoria. The fact is that because there was no effective control of the virus, of the people that were in quarantine in Victoria, we have had the outbreak that we've seen. And it's the preparedness of governments, it's the preparedness of the state government in Victoria that has caused this problem that we're now debating here today. And I reflect in Western Australia, where, thankfully, we've actually managed quite well with the health crisis. Businesses are back open. Business cafes are, are enjoying great trade. Uh, 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 holiday spots uh, north and south of the uh, of the of the of Perth uh, have enjoyed a, a, a terrific winter season. Thankfully, I was up there uh, in Kalbarri and I got to see some magnificent new infrastructure and uh, that's been built by by the, 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 the Department of Parks and Wildlife. Magnificent. But the reality is. I'm concerned about whether or not we are actually fully prepared, because what the WA government has done is they've put up this hard border and, I think, convinced the population that we're safe behind this hard border. And you know what? The border does provide some protection. There is no doubt about that. But what happens when one of those 450 trucks that necessarily come across the border to bring food and produce and, and necessary supplies, what happens if one of those truck drivers have the virus because they come from a virus hotspot? Or what happens if someone breaks out of a quarantine uh, hotel, like what we saw on, on, uh, on the, over the weekend in Perth? Someone broke out, went down to the pub, had a few drinks. Now, they were from Queensland and didn't come from a hotspot. But what if that person had actually come from an area where there was a virus and they themselves had a virus? Is WA prepared? Is WA actually ready? Have we got the testing capability? Have we got the capability to deal with it? And I wonder, I wonder whether we do. And what we need to see is a, is, a, is, a, is a refocusing on our efforts to ensure that we are protecting our states. And we didn't see that in Victoria. We didn't see a preparation. We didn't see a preparedness to do, take the tough decisions to ensure that we've got the capability across our systems to ensure that we lock up the, of the, the, the virus and where it breaks out. And so I want to encourage Premier Mark McGowan Order. to look at the system and make sure that we've got the preparedness necessary. Thank you, Senator necessary. O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Deputy President. Well, what we have today is a minister and a government who have presided over neglect in our aged care system, neglect of aged care residents prior to COVID-19 and neglect of aged care residents during this pandemic. And what we've heard today is a minister and a government who refuse to take responsibility for their inaction. They refuse to take responsibility for the neglect that they have presided over in the aged care system for seven years. And whether it's about the extraordinary number of aged care homes that are consistently failing quality and safety checks prior to this pandemic and his inaction, this minister's inaction, whether it's about the warnings of COVID outbreaks earlier this year at Dorothy Henderson Lodge and Newmarch House and his inaction, whether it's about the deaths in aged care from neglect, tragic deaths, in addition to the tragic loss of life from COVID-19 and his inaction, 
whether it's about last year's Royal Commission report entitled Neglect and his inaction, what we have heard today is a minister who refuses to take responsibility, a minister who has no explanation. He has no answers. He can't tell us what he did about the 45 per cent of aged care homes that were failing audits last year prior to COVID-19. He can't tell us what he did to prevent further outbreaks after the lessons of Dorothy Henderson and Newmarch should have been learned. He can't tell us why mistakes were still being made at St Basil's in Victoria months later. And he can't tell us why he hasn't acted on the Royal Commission calling for $600 million a year in extra funding. He can't tell us what the government's response is to the Royal Commission's interim report entitled Neglect. Neglect. He can't explain any of it here today. He won't take responsibility for any of it, but he is responsible, and this government is responsible for aged care in this country. He is responsible for not taking action on the warnings that were there, the warnings that were there overseas, the warnings that were here in Australia, in New South Wales, earlier this year. He is responsible. And we're talking about the deaths of over 460 people who have tragically died as a result of COVID-19 in aged care in Australia. We are talking about mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters and grandparents. These are real people. They are not numbers in a report and they deserve a better explanation of what has happened than we have heard from this minister and from this government today. Because I cannot begin to imagine just how difficult it has been for the families of those more, more than 460 people, um, unable to see their loved ones as they were dying of COVID-19 in aged care homes. The stories that we hear have been absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, it is a tragedy. And we are facing an aged care disaster, and we have been facing this disaster not just for weeks, not for months, but for years. We have been facing it and we have had warnings. We have had report after report, and we have had minister after minister in this government who have refused to take any action, who have refused to put plans in place, who have refused to take responsibility, who refuse to be accountable, who cannot explain to us how it is that they believe that they can keep older Australians safe in our aged care facilities today. Uh, and this minister, this is a minister who last week literally turned his back on this parliament. He literally walked out on the questions that he was being asked to answer, that he was being asked to be accountable for. He turned his back uh, on his accountability, on his responsibility to the parliament and on his responsibility to the Australian people. Uh, the Australian people have lost confidence in this minister, in this minister, Senator Colbeck. They have lost confidence and it is time for this minister to resign, to pack up his office and to resign. Thank you, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Senator Cormann to my question today relating to the government's plans to rush through legislation that is ultimately going to weaken Australia's environmental laws and to make it easier for big mining corporations and big gas companies to continue to destroy Australia's precious environment, to put in harm's way our native wildlife and animals. Of course, we know that the environment is already suffering greatly. It is in a huge state of decline. We know climate change, land clearing, pollution is pushing our environment and our natural world to the brink. And what do we have from this government? More ways to make more money for these companies while destroying our environment. And it's being done under the cover of COVID-19. Now, I ask the minister, why on earth 
Would we be wanting to hand powers over to the states without any form of strong environmental standards? Of course, we know that big intervention from the Commonwealth government, important intervention from the Commonwealth government, has actually saved some of Australia's most iconic parts of our environment, the Great Barrier Reef, the Franklin. It stopped whaling in WA. Because this is when the federal government stepped in, when state governments were failing to protect our precious species and our environment. Now, if we hadn't had that, we'd have oil rigs on the Great Barrier Reef, the Franklin would be dammed, and whaling may still be going on in WA if the federal government at the time had not intervened. Real leaders, like former Prime Minister Bob Hawke, former Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, leaders who stood up for their nation's environment, not like these cowards over here on the red benches who do nothing but hand over more and more ways to big corporations to destroy our environment in the name of profit. Now, I'm not going to take much of what Minister Cormann has said uh, seriously, because of course this guy doesn't really know anything about protecting the environment. Minister Cormann doesn't really care about the environment. I was interested to uh, read in the new book by Marion Wilkinson that Mr Cormann's experience with and that of course is the book named uh, The Carbon Club. That Mr Cormann's experience with the environment is huddling together on a weekly basis with Corey Bernardi. Remember him? To destroy carbon protecting, environment protecting legislation in this place. Cormann, Minister Cormann has no idea what he's talking about when it comes to looking after the environment. This government simply doesn't care. They can't be trusted. They don't care, and they're trying to make an easy path for the big corporations to keep polluting, to keep mining, to keep logging, and to keep making profits off the back of Australia's environment and uh, the habitat of our wildlife. Now, I asked a question in relation to Rio Tinto, and the reason I ask that is because, of course, the head of Rio Tinto is currently in Australia. He's just arrived two weeks ago. He's been through quarantine. I was listening today about all of the Australians who are still stranded overseas trying to get home. Well, we know one person who, was mani who managed to get into Australia. What is he doing here? He's meeting with the traditional owners in WA who owned the caves that his company blew up. He's having to apologise because we didn't have laws that were strong enough to stop this environmental vandalism. So if there's anyone in this country right now who knows why we need stronger environmental laws, you'd think it'd be the head of Rio Tinto. Why on earth would we trust that this government is going to do the right thing by our country's environment? Their track record is atrocious. I call on Rio Tinto to stand with the Greens and to argue that there needs to be stronger environmental protections to declare their opposition to this push from the government, because they, of all people, know firsthand what happens when there isn't proper protections in place. You know what happens? Big companies blow up ancient Aboriginal Order. heritage Hanson, and destroy young, our environment. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any